Okay, folks, let's get started. Happy Monday. Nobody's ever happy on Monday. I am. You're happy? He's happy. All right, so we are uh, in uh, the process of translation. Today we're going to look at it up close and personal. And um, <clears throat> at first I'll start out with some very general things, and then we'll move into uh, some more detail. Um, everybody, I think, from who's ever taken high school biology knows about the genetic code, so I'm not going to spend a significant amount of time on it, but I will point out, obviously, that the genetic code is the... Um, three nucleotide designation that specifies amino acids for making into proteins. The genetic code is read off of messenger RNAs, which are in turn read off of DNAs. And the genetic code has uh, some features that are interesting about it. One feature is redundancy. There are 64 possible combinations of three letter codes. And to read this, one would go through, uh, for example, read this as U, U, and then U would correspond to the very top one. U, U, G would correspond to the bottom one here. What you notice in looking at the code is that there are, as I, there is, as I say, redundancy, meaning that uh, most amino acids are specified by more than one three-letter designation. The... Um, Arrangement of these is not random. Okay? If we look, for example, at uh, CU anything, that is CUU, CUC, CUA, CUG, we see that they, are all, spec they all specify leucine. Okay? And um, what that tells us is that the third position for most of the genetic code is the least important position. Okay? It's the least important. It's where we uh, talk about having wobble. Wobble referring to the fact that for many of the codons, the third position can be almost anything. And if it's not almost anything, it is certainly biased in terms of purines versus pyrimidines. Let's look up here at leucine here. UUA, UUG, okay? So it's UU purine specifies leucine. Similarly, if we look up here at tyrosine, U a U, U, A, C, U, A, pyrimidine specifies tyrosine, okay? So um, the genetic code is um, important. Some amino acids are only specified by one codon. That, there's one right there. Tryptophan is only specified by U, G, G, okay? The genetic code also has what are called punctuation features, and the punctuation features refer to what's called a start codon, and the start codon, um, as, uh, as you probably know, is AUG, and AUG specifies methionine. Methionine is almost always the first amino acid that is built into proteins, whether it is prokaryotes or eukaryotes. You'll notice also that that is the only codon that specifies methionine, AUG. AUG tells cells where to start making a protein, and we'll see uh, how prokaryotes and eukaryotes do that a little bit differently uh, uh, with respect to each other, but they both do, in fact, start with uh, methionine. The other uh, punctuation marks of the code are the stop codons, of which there are three, and yes, I think you should know the sequence of the start codon and the three stop codons. The three stop codons are UGA, as you can see here, UAG, which is seen here, I'm sorry, UAA, and UAG, which is seen here, all right? So those are the three stop codons. The genetic code is what, <coughs> excuse me, is what we describe as universal, meaning that essentially every cell uses the same code. There are some very minor exceptions to the code. There are some mitochondria, for example, that use a slightly modified code, and the slight modifications usually involve the change of one codon, okay? So, for example, some places, UGA, which is a stop codon here, is also used to code for tryptophan. So, it's not absolute, but for our purposes, we, we will refer to it as universal. If we compare the genetic code of human beings to the genetic code of E. coli, okay, a single-cell prokaryote, they're identical. They're identical. So, that means that if I take 
a protein sequence and I insert it into E. coli, if I set things up properly, I can have E. coli translate my protein coding sequence and make human proteins in its cells. That's one of the roots of biotechnology uh, as we have talked about. The, uh, when we think about the pairing that exists between uh, the uh, messenger RNA and the tRNAs, which is what I'll get to in just a little bit, I keep jumping to the wrong one, we can, well, there we go. Where did I put that? There it is, right here. Okay. Um, we can envision that there is a base pairing that has to occur between the transfer RNA, which brings in the amino acid for translation, and the messenger RNA uh, in the, uh, it's being held by the ribosome. This schematic shows that base pairing. And you'll see something different in this, okay? On the bottom, you see the sequence of a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is where the codon, and the codon is the three base sequence that specifies an amino acid. The messenger RNA is where the codon is located. Okay? The complementary sequence to that codon is called the anticodon, and it's contained at the end of a transfer RNA. Now you see something interesting here. Okay? C pairs with G, G pairs with C, but in that third position, you see a different base. It's a base that you've seen before. It's called inosine. And inosine, you may recall, was the branch nucleotide that uh, either specified A or G during nucleotide uh, biosynthesis. Uh, I turns out, the reason I is present there is I has several stable pairings. You can see in this case, I will pair with C. Now, why do uh, cells do that? Well. They do it for efficiency purposes. If you recall, I said that the third position of the codon, that is the third position right there where that C is, is a wobble. It can vary. Well, if you use a third position up here in the anticodon, that is a base that can pair with multiple things, it means you don't have to make a corresponding transfer RNA for every single possible third base of that codon one or two transfer RNAs will suffice. Now, I remind you that when we do base pairing, we have to do base pairing anti-parallel. So we see 5 prime to 3 prime going left to right on the mRNA, and we see 5 prime to 3 prime going right to left in the transfer RNA. If we look at the pairings that inosine can do, we see the following. Okay? Inosine can pair with U or C or A, and that means that by putting an inosine in that wobble position, that only one transfer RNA will handle all three of those bases. That's a very useful uh, thing. It saves the cell time and energy in having to make messenger RNAs. Another thing that we see with RNA is that GU base pairs are stable. GT base pairs in DNA are not stable. GU base pairs are stable, and that means that U can pair with A or G, and G can pair with U or C. So there's some fluctuation that can happen with the stability of the pairings uh, between two different RNAs. OK. Um, that just simply shows the hydrogen bonds. No, you don't need to worry about the hydrogen bonds and so forth. But suffice it to say that inosine gives some flexibility with respect to pairings of the transfer RNA to the messenger RNA. OK. Well, this uh, figure schematically shows what a transfer RNA look like, looks like. Uh, in fact, in three dimensions, it doesn't look anything like this. Uh, there, uh, it's sort of a bent over structure. But uh, in two dimensions, this is the way one would draw it. You'll notice that it has ex extensive secondary structure, meaning that, and tertiary structure, meaning that it has base pairs within a given strand. This is one single strand of RNA. So this guy is pairing within itself, as we have seen other RNAs do. And looking at this, you can also see by the lettering that's here, there are quite a few modified bases that are present. Okay? So there's a UH2. All right? um, there's a pseudouridine right there. There's a pseudouridine there. Um, this is a modified uridine residue here. 
There's quite a few modifications. There's a methyl G, et cetera. And again, you don't need to worry about the specifics of that. But suffice it to say that there's quite a, few, quite a bit of chemical modification that happens to transfer RNAs. At the very bottom of the structure, you see the um, anticodon that I referred to earlier. And the anticodon uh, is the part that pairs with the uh, messenger RNA. Up at the other end is where the uh, three prime end of the messenger RNA is. That's where that CCA sequence is that I talked about before. And that CCA sequence is the place for attachment of the amino acid. Now, in order for the genetic code to be functional, the proper amino acid has to get put onto here corresponding to the anticodon that will pair with the messenger RNA's codon. Okay? So it turns out that there are enzymes that will cor correctly read the anticodon and put the proper amino acid onto the three prime end of the transfer RNA. I'll say a little bit about those. Some people describe that as the first step in the process of translation. Um, I will, um, there's more blah. This is the actual structure if we try to depict it in three dimensions. And it's a little harder to see that uh, actual structure uh, that's there. But that's um, basically a 3D projection of the uh, overall molecule. And this is another uh, projection of the same thing. And up here, far way over here, is where this uh, amino acid gets attached. Okay, well, I said that there are enzymes that will, uh, in fact, attach the proper amino acid to the proper transfer RNA with that corresponding anticodon. That's really critically important because if random amino acids get put onto transfer RNAs, then the genetic code won't have any meaning. There has to be a proper linkage between the anticodon sequence and the amino acid sequence. Well, it turns out that cells have enzymes called amino acyl tRNA synthetases. There's the, there's the magic name right there that you want. Okay? Amino acyl tRNA synthetases. These are enzymes that perform that catalysis. And it turns out there's one enzyme for each amino acid. One enzyme for each amino acid. So there are 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. And if there are different tRNAs for that same um, amino acid, then those synthetases have to also be able to accommodate different, slightly different uh, tRNAs in order to put the proper amino acid onto there. Okay. Um, this shows us, starting from top to down. This is the far end of that tRNA. I wish they would use a consistent designation. Here they put it at the bottom. But here is the very three prime end of that um, transfer RNA that I schematically showed you before with the three prime end being at the top. And we can see that the amino acid has been covalently attached via an ester bond to the terminal A residue that's on that uh, uh, tRNA. So what that enzyme is catalyzing is the formation of an ester bond of the appropriate amino acid to the A residue at the end. Specifically, it's getting onto the ribose. It's not going on the adenine. It's going onto the ribose of the A uh, nucleotide. In this case, we see that the attachment is to the oxygen on carbon number three of the ribose. Some amino acyl tRNA synthetases will attach it to carbon number two. Okay? But you can see that either is available, and uh, that's where this guy gets attached. One of the things that we discover about this attachment is that this bond right here between the amino acid and that ribose of the, ad uh, of the adenosine, this bond is very, very unstable. Very unstable, meaning that if it encounters water in about a half a second, half of the molecules will lose this amino acid. It'll be cleaved. So that means that once this bond is made, there has to be protection to keep it from interacting with water. And we'll see that's actually a consideration in the function of some of the proteins in translation. 
Okay. I said it was critically important that the amino acyl tRNA synthetases properly read the anticodon and put the appropriate amino acid on. And we've seen that cells are very careful in all of the things that they do. We saw in DNA replication that there were uh, proofreading. There was even post-replication repair that happened with respect to damage or other things uh, in the DNA. I've talked about how transcription has some uh, built-in controls to ensure that transcription is, is um, uh, fairly accurate. What you see on the screen is a depiction of an amino acyl tRNA synthetase in which proofreading of another sort is actually happening. These enzymes have a way of checking, have I put the proper amino acid onto the tRNA? So they don't just put it on, they actually uh, check to see that if they've got the right one on there. And this happens as a result of action of an editing site that's within the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. The amino acid gets put on to one place in the enzyme and then the structure flips and the editing site checks to make sure that the right amino acid has been placed in there. It's slightly more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's uh, a proofreading function that's occurring. Jody? This is while it's still bound down here to the anticodon. Still bound to the anticodon, yep. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, I kind of like this figure, although it's kind of big and hairy and complex. You can see on the uh, right side, you can see this amino acyl tRNA synthetase uh, schematically uh, drawn for you. Uh, you can see that one end of it is reading the anticodon loop, the other end of it is putting on the appropriate amino acid, and then there's the editing site where it flips over and checks to make sure everything uh, works okay. It's a very cool and complicated structure um, that's there. Now, um, one of the things we've learned about uh, analyzing that interaction between the amino acyl tRNA synthetase and the um, transfer RNA is that the anticodon loop is only part of what the uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase actually reads. Okay? It turns out that tRNAs differ slightly f from one to another in terms of their internal sequence, as you can see here. And these yellow ends indicate possible places where amino acyl tRNA synthetases can actually read and confirm that they've gotten the right amino acid onto that transfer RNA. So there are other things besides the anticodon loop that vary from one tRNA to another. And the amino acyl tRNA synthetase uh, is tuned into those differences as well. Well, all of these ensure, of course, that translational fidelity meaning getting the right amino acid into a protein uh, is reasonably high. When we look at the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, what we discover is that they fit into two groups, one group of 10 and another group of 10. Okay? And though there are other differences besides what I'm going to tell you, I will just keep it simple and say, that the class I enzymes have a different mechanism than the class II enzymes. They actually do look at different things on the tRNA. And in addition, they differ in where they put their amino acid. You remember I pointed out that that ribose, the amino acid, could go on to carbon number two or carbon number three of ribose. It turns out that class I enzymes and no, you don't need to know which ones are in which class. But class one enzymes put the amino acid onto carbon number two. Class two enzymes put the amino acid onto carbon number three. Okay. This schematically shows, and again, you don't need to worry too much about the details, the way, the different ways in which the different enzymes actually bind to the tRNAs. You can see that the class I enzymes bind on one side of the transfer RNA. The class II enzymes bind on the 180 degrees on the opposite side of the transfer RNA. Okay, well, that's some pretty basic uh, stuff. That first step, though, 
That's called charging a, an amino acid. That first step is the attachment of the amino acid to the tRNA. Okay? So when we talk about this, the process of translation, we think of it as occurring in really four steps. The first step being the charging of the amino acid, putting the amino acid onto the proper tRNA. Once the proper amino acid has been put onto the tRNA, it's important, uh, of course, for that amino acid and that bond between the amino acid and the tRNA to be protected from water. And as I said, we'll see some proteins involved in that process. The actual translation of a um, sequence is performed, as you know, by ribosomes. And ribosomes are really interesting oddball structures. Um, ribosomes um, contain what are called two subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit. And each subunit has multiple proteins. There's about 50 proteins in a ribosome. Okay? Many, many proteins involved in this bigger structure. But as you can see here, all right, the colors that jump out at you, the things that jump out at you, are actually the, the ribosomal RNAs. A ribosome contains not only proteins, but ribosomal RNA molecules. Before I say about those, I probably should talk about this designation, 30S, 50S, 70S. Okay? So the um, way people measure sizes of macromolecular complexes is by the rate with which they get uh, forced by a centrifugal force through a medium. The faster it moves, the different the value that it has. The smaller a molecule is, okay, the smaller a molecule is, the um, uh, um, different will be the rate as it passes through a solution. Okay? So a smaller guy is not going to move as fast as a bigger guy is going to move through if everything else is equal. And that rate with which things move is called a Svedberg unit. S-V-E-D-B-E-R-G. That's what this S refers to here. Okay? So the small subunit of a ribosome in E. coli has a size of 30 S, 30 Svedberg units. The large subunit moves faster. It has a size of 50 Svedberg units. And if we put the two together as an intact ribosome, you'll see that the Svedberg units are not additive, but they make a larger 70S. Okay. So this is the intact. These two don't obviously add up to 70. Yes? Is sedimentation coefficient also acceptable? Yes, sedimentation coefficient is also acceptable. You want to call that instead of a Sedberg unit. That's correct. Um, these sizes are different in eukaryotic cells, but they're the same relative amount. So in a eukaryotic cell, the small subunit has a size of 40S, the large subunit has a size of 60S, and the combined ribosome has a size of 80S. All right? So if I talk about an 80S ribosome, I'm talking about a eukaryotic ribosome. I'm talking about a 70S ribosome. I'm talking about a prokaryotic. Okay. Now, the sizes really aren't uh, the most important uh, thing here. The ribosomal RNAs play very important roles in this process. If we look in E. coli, which is the simpler uh, system, there are three ribosomal RNAs. Three ribosomal RNAs. The 30S subunit contains one of those. It's called the 16S. And again, that's a Svedberg unit again. The 16S ribosomal RNA. Okay. The 50S subunit, the larger one, contains two. It contains what's called the 18S. And I'm sorry, it contains the... Um, um, actually, I'm getting my numbers wrong now. Um, 16 and, yeah, 20, I think it's 23S. 23S is in the larger, is the larger uh, ribosomal RNA that's in uh, E. coli. The 23S and a smaller one called a 5S are both contained in the large subunit. Now, each of these has different functions, all right? I'm going to give you functions for the 16S and for the 23S uh, as we get going along. Okay. All right. Now, and I haven't said those functions yet, but I'll save that for a second. 
When we go to translate a message, and I'm talking here not we, but E. coli, when E. coli goes to translate a message, as I said, all cells start with methionine. In prokaryotic cells, however, they start with a, a modified form of methionine. Okay? So their initiator, what's called their initiator tRNA, that is the one that's going to come in and bring in that very first amino acid, brings in not methionine, but something called formyl methionine. All right? Formyl methionine looks like this. Okay? And no, you don't need to know the structure of that. But it is a chemically modified form of methionine. It only occurs for the very first amino acid in a protein, in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes don't do this. Why is this here? Well, it turns out that in getting the synthesis of a protein started, this very first amino group turns out to be reactive. And it can cause a reaction to occur that will stop translation if it's not covered up. So prokaryotes avoid that problem by covering it up with this formula group. And so the very first amino acid that's put into a prokaryotic protein is formula methionine. All right. We compared sequences of the... Um, DNAs where there were genes and we saw that there were common features that were lo located very close to the transcriptional start site. We called those uh, common sequences Tata box as part of a promoter, for example. If we do the same thing for messenger RNA sequences and we compare them to their location relative to the start site, the start being AUG, in some cases, you see alternatives used. You know, there's a GUG right there. It's not common, but it does happen occasionally. If we compare those sequences, we see a smattering of uh, conserved sequences there, kind of like we saw with the promoter. These conserved sequences are within 10 base pairs of the, or 10, not 10 base pairs, but 10 bases of the start site. This being number one, there's minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right there. Okay. The consensus of this sequence is GGAGG. And it turns out this sequence has a very, very important function. First of all, it's called a Shine Delgarno sequence. S H I N E dash D A L. G-A-R-N-O. It's named for the people who discovered it. The Shine Delgarno sequence is a sequence that can form base pairs with a region of the 16S ribosomal RNA in the small subunit. Okay? Well, why is that important? The reason that that is important is it is telling the cell where to start translating. Where to start translating. Okay? That turns out to be important because as we can see, there are many places where there are other, there's an AUG right there. Okay? This helps position the proper AUG in the place where translation is going to occur. So the function of the Shine Delgarno is to tell the ribosome where you start translation because that, that proper AUG is placed into the start place for translation to occur. The Shindogarno sequence is found in prokaryotic cells. It is not found in eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes use a different approach. Okay. When I showed the schematic figure of the ribosome the other day, I pointed out that there were three sites that we were concerned about. I called them E and P and A. Okay. If we look at this ribosome here, there's the A site, there's the P site, there's the E site. And they are specific locations where a codon can sit. A specific location where a codon can sit. 
in the process of translation, we could imagine that there is a messenger RNA running through this ribosome, running through the ribosome right here. Okay? Translation, like every other process you've seen, occurs in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So the 5 prime end of the ribosome would be over here. I'm sorry, 5 prime end of the messenger RNA would be over here. The 3 prime end of the messenger RNA would be over here. And the ribosome would be moving from left to right in translating that sequence. That means that the incoming codons where the, the um, uh, transfer RNAs will pair, the incoming codons will first appear in the A site. And the process of translation, the ribosome will move along the messenger RNA. They will then move to the E site, I'm sorry, to the P site, and then finally to the E site, and then they exit. And E stands for exit. So translation is occurring 5 prime to 3 prime, one codon at a time, one three base sequence at a time, and these sites provide places for one codon to sit. Okay. This now schematically shows what is happening in the process of translation. Now, I'm gonna, this is actually jumping the gun just a little bit because it is, um, the ribosome has already been assembled and we're going to say a little bit about that. But after the ribosome has been assembled, we can see what I just told you in words. That is, there's the messenger RNA, 5 prime end on the left side, 3 prime end on the right side. There's the A, the P, and the E. And not only can we see in this schematic the messenger RNA, but we can also see the anti-codon loop of the transfer RNAs holding amino acids. What we see here is a protein sequence that's in the process of being made. This already has two amino acids, and the next step, this green guy is going to get attached to this purple guy. As I say, this jumps the gun a little bit, but it gives you an overview of what's happening in this process. Okay, I'm kind of going kind of fast, so I'll slow down and ask if you have any questions before I dive into some mechanism. Yes, sir. A little bit on the representation on those. You show them in the two-dimensional sort of a line with your amino acid on the down the bottom. But in reality, since those are L-shaped, they kind of go in and out of the plane, or are they sideways in those? Yes, good question. So uh, the question is, tRNAs aren't flat, and I'm drawing everything in flat structures. Yes, there's a very important three-dimensional component to all of this. So these are all very schematic drawings. Okay, maybe we want to take a break and do a song. How about that? All right, I've got several songs about translation, so we'll do one of them here. The codon song. Building of proteins, you ought to know, needs amino A's. Peptide bond catalysis in ribosomes. Triplet bases, three-letter codes. Mixing and matching nucleotides. Who is keeping score? Here is the lowdown. If you count codons, you'll get 64. Da -da 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 Got to line up right. 16S RNA and shine down Garnocytes. You can make peptides every size with the proper code. Start codons positioned in the P-site place. Initiator tRNAs, UGA stops and AUGs go. Who could ask for more? You know the low down count of the codons. There are 64. Nobody knows that song except me, I think. <laughs> okay, and I don't know it very well. Okay, well, we're at the second step in that translation process. The first step being the charging of the amino acids by the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. That's happening away from the ribosome. Everything we're going to talk about now occurs in the ribosome. The very first step in that process is initiation. And as I mentioned with respect to comparison to transcription, 
initiation, elongation, and termination also are three phases of the translation process. What you see on the screen is a depiction of the initiation phase. And the initiation phase requires that this ribosomal complex be assembled. Okay? This actually has to assemble before translation can occur. The assembly requires several things. First, it requires the small subunit to start. It requires three initiation factors. And they're very simple. They're called IF1, IF2, IF3. We're not going to distinguish their functions. You'll also see when we get to the elongation phase that there are three elongation factors as well. Okay? The third thing that we need to get everything started is a messenger RNA to translate. The initiation factors facilitate a couple of things. One is the binding of the messenger RNA to the small subunit. And the second is bringing in the very first initiator tRNA. That's the methionine, the formal methionine tRNA. This is the only tRNA that gets, gets its start in the P site. It actually starts in the P site. And you'll notice that this is called IF2. That is what brings in that formal methionine. That formal methionine is brought in by IF2, and yes, IF2 is protecting that, that bond against water. So it's covering up the bond. It's not shown very clearly here, but it's covering up the bond between the tRNA and that formula methionine so that water doesn't cleave it. After these things have been positioned properly, and the other thing that has to happen here is the shine delgarno sequence in the, in the um, uh, messenger RNA has to be aligned with the 16S sequence so that we know which is the proper AUG to put into the, uh, the start uh, uh, site, which is the P site. Okay? After this has been aligned properly, then we can um, add the large subunit and everything is, the initiation phase is done at that point. So the initiation phase basically involves assembling the ribosomal complex, three initiation factors, the one I told you the function of is IF2, which brings in the formal methionine, puts it in the P site, and we're ready to start. Okay? So you'll notice we haven't translated anything yet. All we have at this point is a ribosome with an amino acyl tRNA, formal methionine, sitting in the P site. That's all we have. We have what's called the 70S initiation complex at that point. Well, elongation is where the peptide bonds are actually formed, and that occurs here. Okay? So here's where we finished initiation. There's the P site, and we can see that there's the messenger RNA that it's paired to, and up here in the 50S subunit is the other part of the P site, which is where the amino acid is sitting. Another amino acid... Uh, acyl tRNA comes in, and there's two possibilities. One is that this anticodon is perfectly paired, in which case the right amino acyl, uh, the amino acyl tRNA has come in, or it's not going to properly pair, in which case the wrong one has come in. You'll notice I'm calling it amino acyl tRNA. I'm distinguishing that from an amino acyl tRNA synthetase, which is the enzyme that puts it on. Okay. We call the complex an amino acyl tRNA. All right. Now, this incoming tRNA is not bare as it shows here, but in fact it's carried, on, carried in by something called an e elongation factor. There are three elongation factors. And we're going to talk about two of them. The one that carries in the amino acyl tRNA has to, yes, protect this bond against water. And in E. coli, this elongation factor is called EF-TU. 
which sounds very much like IF number two, doesn't it? Okay? EFTU. EFTU covers this guy up. It carries it in. All right? And it does a couple of other things. EFTU is something we call a G protein. What do G proteins do? Well, G proteins, you may recall from last term, are involved in carrying GTP, and they can cleave it for energy. Well, in fact, that's what happens here. If the proper one is inserted, that is, this base pairing is proper in the A site, the EFTU says, OK, my job is done. It cleaves its D GTP, and it gets out of there. That leaves the proper amino acid in the ribosome protected from water, because the, the inner part of the ribosome is also protected from water. If the wrong amino acid, acyl tRNA synthetase has come in, as, I'm sorry, amino acyl tRNA has come in, then these base pairs won't be proper, and EFTU will pull it out and leave. So this is one of the ways in which we ensure that the proper amino acyl tRNA is in the A site. That's thanks to the work of EFTU. EFTU, as you might imagine, is a very important protein in E. coli. It is, in fact, the most abundant protein in E. coli. That sort of makes sense, because you've got to have plenty of it around once you've charged a tRNA onto, with an amino acid. You better have something there to cover up that bond pretty quickly, or you're not going to have the product that you want. OK, so we've brought this in. We've got one amino acyl tRNA in the P site, one amino acyl tRNA in the A site. Each is attached to their own amino acid. They haven't been joined yet. That happens in the next step. The next step is that there's a peptide bond which joins these two guys together. Okay? The joining schematically actually occurs in this little orange uh, region up here. The joining is really interesting. The joining is catalyzed not by an enzyme. I want to repeat that. It's not catalyzed by an enzyme. Peptide bonds are not formed in the cell by enzymes. They're formed by ribozymes, meaning that there's a catalytic RNA in that ribosome. A catalytic RNA is an RNA that can catalyze a bond and the RNA that's in this ribosome that's catalyzing the formation of this bond is the 23S ribosomal RNA. The 23S ribosomal RNA is a ribozyme, R-I-B-O-Z-Y-M-E. All the protein on Earth is made thanks to the catalytic action of a ribosomal RNA. That's true in eukaryotes as well. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. Well, at this point, we have a dipeptide. We see that this guy on the left is soon going to be on its way out. It gets kicked out by the process of elongation. We've already done the first steps of elongation. Now we've got to translocate, meaning we've got to move the ribosome down three more bases. Okay? So notice where we are here. All right? Notice where we are here. We've shifted the bottom. We haven't shifted the top. Okay? This involves translocation, and this translocation process is moving these guys further along. Okay? Here we were in the APE. All right? Now we're going to shift this guy. It's going to move to the left one more. All right? We're moving to the left. So now we see the green guy is underneath the orange one, whereas the blue guy was underneath the orange one over here. We have moved this messenger RNA to the left, or if you want to think about it, we've moved the ribosome to the right. Either way, either is equivalent. Notice now, this guy has two amino acids on it, joined by a peptide bond. This guy has nothing on it. It's ready to exit, and that's why it's in the E site, because E stands for exit. This factor that catalyzes this movement of the ribosome down the messenger RNA is called EFG, which stands for elongation factor G. Elongation factor G is also a G protein. 
It also uses GTP for energy. And as a consequence, we've moved down. We're ready now. We've got an empty A site. And now we can bring in another amino acyl tRNA and continue the process. This figure reminds us of something very important. All of the energy in translation, all of the energy in translation comes from GTP, not ATP. All the energy of translation comes from GTP. There's a third elongation factor. It's not shown on the screen, and I'm not going to talk about it. Okay? But suffice to say, there is a third one that's important as well. OK, this is usually a little confusing, so I'll stop and take questions on this. Yes, Jared. It looks like there's an EPA set also on the 30S. There is, yes. So the, the only movement that's happening is the actual, and these ribosomes are sort of shuffling with respect to each other. That's the moving that's happening. And as a result of that shuffling, this is sliding down the messenger RNA. Yeah. So there is, there is a, and you can see here, like the top is, is, is slightly off compared to where it was right here. Yeah. You talking about right here? Okay. So I would not call this an active site, no. Okay. Active site I would use uh, solely for the purpose of describing catalysis. So well, as you can imagine, this is geometrically different. So it's favoring the breaking of the, of the hydrogen bonds between these guys right here. And remember, we've only got three nucleotides there. So there's not a lot of strong things that's holding that together. Yes, Jody. I've heard this described previously as ratcheting, but in that particular course, the instructor said that your E site remained filled until the next one bumped it out. They all three remained filled until the dissociation. Is that accurate? Um, it's not my understanding that that's accurate. It's my understanding that the E site actually doesn't stay filled for very long. No. I'm not an expert in this, though, I will tell you that. Yeah. Okay. So that's a pretty cool process. We've gone through initiation. We've gone through elongation. There's translocation, uh, which we don't need to worry too much about. I think it confuses the picture a little bit. EFG looks kind of like a transfer RNA. And so it gets into the A site, as you can see there, and kind of pushes things along. OK. Here's EFTU. EFTU, as I said, is the most abundant. Uh, actually, that's not EFTU at all. Uh, all right. This, uh, my link is bad. Uh, this is showing the process of termination. So that elongation process will go on and on and on until a stop codon appears in the A site. When a stop codon appears in the A site, there's nothing that will compare with it because there's no tRNAs that are complementary to the codons, of the, to the stop codons in the A site. So this guy will sit here for a while. And finally, something called a release factor will come in. And the release factor does one thing. It carries, it, first of all, it goes into the A site. It forms a base pair with the UAA. And yes, it is a protein. Okay. What it does is it carries into the inner workings of the ribosome a molecule of water. And guess what the water does? It cleaves the bond between the amino acid at, at the terminus of the um, uh, polypeptide chain and the last tRNA it's attached to. That molecule of water favors the release. Now you can see the polypeptide has been released by the ribosome, and everybody is home free. I didn't mention, but I'll mention briefly here, that you see that this is exiting out the top of this large subunit. There's actually a little tunnel through which the um, uh, growing polypeptide chain emerges as translation occurs. Okay, that's a good stopping point for today. Let's call it a day, and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>